my name is Eddie Burstein, and today uh, we're going to talk about SHA-1. Uh, it has been a uh, joint collaboration with many people. Uh, the, four, the five people who were uh, helping were Mark Steven from CWI, Pierre Kaperman from INRIA, Ange Albertini, Yarek Markov, and Alex Petit-Bianco, who are also from my team. And today I'm going to tell you about how we created this uh, SHA-1 collision. Uh, before that, I will tell you a little bit about the story about how you do cryptanalysis and break hash function, and then we'll talk about what happened in the post-collision world. Um, we had a little bit of problem with the calibration of the video projector, so I tried to shrink down a little bit the slide. Everyone can see them correctly? Yes? All right, awesome. So let's get started. Um, uh, to make sure everyone is on the same page, uh, let me briefly recap what a hash function is. A hash function, or a cryptographic hash function, has two unique properties. The first thing is when you have two files, uh, when if they are different, they should hash to a different digest or short hashes. So basically, a short hash is, is a fixed string uh, which compress your arbitrary long, long file into this uh, unifi unique identifier. And people use that as a unique identifier for files. The other thing that is obvious ob for many of you is that a hash function is one way. You can hash the thing, but you cannot go back, and you cannot learn anything from the file by just looking at the hash. These are the two main properties of a hash function, and a lot of people depend on it. For example, uh, hash functions are used uh, or involved in documents and software signing. Uh, you can use them, for example, for Windows update, Firefox update, and so forth. They are, using, uh, they are used to make sure we can verify the signature. They are also used in the same way for uh, HTTPS certificates. Uh, they are involved into helping ensuring that the SSL certificate are signed by a CA authority and are therefore valid. Uh, they are used in version control, and you will see that play a huge role in our talk. And finally, uh, they are also used in uh, backup integrity to check which file has been backup and if the file has been backup correctly. Uh, they are also used in a slew of other software, uh, including databases, some file system, and so forth. And this is this huge and variety of software which make it very hard to understand uh, all the consequences of what happens when you use a collision. I'll give you an example later in the talk about unforeseen consequences when you try to play with collision. So, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about three things. First, as I said, we're going to look at how we're going to attack hash function. Then we're going to discuss how we found the hash function, uh, the collision, and what happened, and what not. And finally, we'll discuss uh, post-collision world, and more specifically, uh, how you deal with legacy software, we still use SHA-1, and how you do, what is the future hold for hash function, where we're going to. So, before getting started, uh, the one thing it's very important to mention is, uh, SHA-1 collision is just the final straw of a very, very long line of research, and we are standing on the shoulder of giant. Uh, among all the people who contributed, and there is a lot of people who did over the last 15 years, uh, two stand as giant, and they are not me. Uh, they are uh, Wang, who was the first one who, in 2005, came up with a theoretical way to attack both MD5 and SHA-1. She's the one who divided the method that has been refined and finally led to the collision. The second one is my co-author, uh, Mark Steven, who for the, next, the last 10 years actually was the one who kept going at it and despite other people dropping out, uh, decided to hold uh, strong and basically carry out uh, all the work till the end. So they are the two who deserve most of the credit for the work. Uh, I was just lucky to be there and be, help, uh, be able to give them a helpful hand. Uh, actually, a fun anecdote is, as it was my second at attempt at SHA-1, uh, when I was at Stanford back in 2009, 2010, uh, we looked briefly at the idea of trying to help to break SHA-1, and we looked at it, we were like, no way, that's way too complicated, it's too much resource incentive, can't do it, and we gave up. And I think a lot of people did give up as well, because it seemed, uh, except to mark, an impossible task. So I'm glad we were able, as Google, to help uh, providing the resources. Uh, so if you take something from the talk, it's like Mark Steven is the awesome guy, and Wong was the genius behind uh, the theoretical attack who get all started. So, uh, attacking hash function. Uh, there are quite a few confusion about what are the different type of attack are, so I'm going to sum them up. Uh, but before that, a quick show of hand. How many of you know what a collision attack is? Quite a few, okay, okay. Uh, how many of you know how, what is a pre-image attack? Wait, less, way, more, less people, right, okay. How about a second pre-image attack? Okay, so to make sure we're all on the same page, we're going to briefly recap. We'll see it's a bunch of few diagrams. It's, very, it's going to be very quick. Uh, so a collision attack, and that's the topic of today, is basically uh, the attacker have two files in control, 
And the goal is you create two files who hash to the same thing. So basically, you are violating, as I said, the early principle that two files should hash to a different hash function. That is a collision attack. We have also another type of attack, which is called pre-image attack. In that case, uh, the atta there is an unknown file, and you know the hash, and the goal as an attacker is to be able to engineer a second file which will hash to the same thing. The second pre-image attack, which is the one which is confused the most people, is where you know a file, let's say your SSL certificate, and as an attacker, you create a file which is a doppelganger in the sense that it actually has the same hash. So far so good? Yes? Awesome. Okay, so how do you create a collision attack? That's the one where basically we have a lot of practical resort. Uh, pre-image and second pre-image don't have a practical attack uh, for the main hash functions such as SHA-1, but also MD5, and of course the newer one like SHA-256. So we're going to focus on the collision attack, uh, which we can do in practice. So collision attack are not brute force attack. That's the first thing which is important to understand. You cannot brute force your way out of creating a collision. Uh, it's impractical. Even if you were to use GPU, and even if you were to use a ton of GPU, you can't. To give you an idea, we think it's about 12 million years of computation with a GPU to get to a collision, not going to happen. So if you can't do that, what, what are you going to do? You are going to use something which is called cryptanalysis. And the idea of cryptanalysis is we are studying how the function uh, diffuse the, the bits and how they scramble them in a way to find biases that we can exploit to reduce the size of the computation to a point where we can finally do it. So I'm going to give you a primer on cryptanalysis. I'm going to skip a ton of detail. Uh, it's just for you to get an idea. Uh, if you want more detail, uh, research paper, not me. All right, so here is a view of, am I missing a slide here? Uh, okay. Okay, we're missing that, that's fine. Okay, so here is the unrolled version of the SHA-1 uh, compressed function. Uh, so the SHA-1 compressed function is not the one you're going to find on Wikipedia. If you go to the Wikipedia page, you get a more simpler function. So the reason why we use this representation is because when we do cryptanalysis, we need to understand very precisely each of the steps of the function. This is what happens when you have a block. So you chop up your uh, file into small block and you hash them and then you pass it to the next and to the next using something called a Dam, uh, Damgar Merkle construction. So basically, it's a function who does the scrambling, right? And we study it, it's 80 steps long, and you see them on the screen, or at least a representation of them. And we do study how the bit flows through the thing. And the thing which provides the scrambling are these little uh, pu purple box, uh, like f is a nonlinear function, plus is a 32-bit modulo um, operation, and so forth. So, how cryptanalysis works? Um, the idea is we are studying message differential paths. So the idea is we try to understand for a group of messages uh, how the bits are moving and how they are being uh, swapped around or, or flipped and so forth, and that's the red dot you see on the screen. So when we have this understanding, that gives rise to what we call an uh, equation system, and for SHA-1, we know exactly what happened for the first 16 steps. Remember, there's 80 of those. So for the first 16, it's basically solved, and we understand what happened so we can understand how to reduce the computation. Now we have reduced the computation uh, by 16 steps. Then uh, we use a bunch of tricks, uh, including boomerang, neutral bit, and so forth, which is basically try to, care, to counteract the, the chaos and the entropy creeping up uh, to the point of pushing the computation to a smaller part uh, by another eight, uh, eight steps, which is up to step 24. And then, well, we don't know. And that's the part where you need this huge computation, that's the intuition at least where this is the part from 24 to 80 where we have kind of, we cannot really understand what happened and it's too big, the state explosion is too large, so we cannot, that's why we use the GPU to actually compute all the possibility or a huge fraction of those because we cannot understand what happened there. So, how do you create a collision? Well, we use the idea from Wong, which is the idea of using two collision, two blocks. So you have a, a bunch of the beginning of the file, which we call the prefix, and this is whatever you want. And then we have a first block, which we call a near collision. So what is a near collision? A near collision is two blocks, which basically are very close to each other uh, for definition of uh, closeness. So basically, imagine that those two are a good candidate, and they are different, but they are sufficiently close that we have a good uh, guess, or we have a good uh, belief that they're going to be resolved with a second block. So basically, we take the input of those two blocks, and then we have the, blo the second block who basically cancel out those, those two collisions, the collision, and then you end up with the same output. 
So at that point, the left and the right will have exactly the same output, and after that, you can put whatever you want after that uh, because the collision has been resolved. That is the basic idea of the collision, and the non-intuitive part is we use two block. All you have to really remember is we have a prefix, which is basically something you have to choose in advance. Then you have the near collision, collision, and then after that, it's all the same. From a perspective, it's all the same because there is no dependency in how you can create a hash function to the past. So at that point, it's identical, and you can put whatever you want for the uh, suffix. So, okay, so I'm going to skip this one. This was the one before. I don't know, I'm not sure what happened. So how do you exploit collision? So exploiting collision. Uh, the one we do it for SHA-1 is what we call the fixed prefix attack, which means uh, we had to create a prefix, so choose a green box, uh, before we're doing the computation because we can't change it afterward because it feeds into the collision. So we selected the prefix, and you have to select it in a very smart way. And then we have the collision blocks. And after that, well, you can do what we call an arbitrary suffix, which is uh, you can jam whatever you want uh, before, after that, and you can create many, many documents which have a collision in it. And we'll show you how we can exploit that in a minute. So uh, here's how it works. Uh, so it doesn't seem very powerful, right? Because you're like, well, you have to choose everything, and everything is pre-computed. Uh, that is true, but the prefix you choose will actually influence how much you can do. In our cases, we use PDF and JPEG. You can think of other stuff like EES, um, uh, like other type of file format which have flexibility, but PDF for us was the best one. And so the idea is we use a collision block to change the length of specific fields, such as comment, and that way what we, dis what we display on the screen will be different from file one because it's going to point to one part of the suffix, and on the other file, it's going to point to another part of the suffix. And that way, even though we have the same suffix, we are able to display different view of the world uh, because the collision blocks themselves are used to control some of the display uh, function. I'll show you a practical example uh, later on in the talk. All right. Uh, chosen prefix attack. So that's why the one which was used in MD5. <coughs> this is for reference. MD5 is, is way more weaker, so in that specific case, you don't have to worry about choosing a specific prefix. You can use the one you want. And that gives you way more uh, flexibility. I'm going to show you a practical attack. It was using the MD5 attack just to illustrate the purpose. All right. Enough theory. <sighs> now we're going to go to the uh, real world attack, and I'm going to show you exactly how to use those things in practice. And we're going to start with MD5 because that's the one which happened about. Um, eight years ago, and so we have a lot of uh, hindsight to look at and a lot of real attack to show you. SHA-1 is too new to have those kind of stuff. It gives you a sense of what you can do when you have those collisions in real. So in two, in <clears throat> the first attack which was created um, using the MD5 collision in practice was creating a rogue SSL certificate. If you're able to manipulate the signature of a certificate, it turns out you can create a self-signing certificate for everything you want which is valid, then you can impersonate any website on the planet. This is what Mark did with Alex Sorotorov and a bunch of other people uh, back in 2009. And so the way it works is as follows. This is what an SSL certificate looks like. Uh, you have a bunch of fields, which are the serial number and the validity period, which are uh, from the, uh, which I give you by the registrar, and then you have the real cert name, which is basically which domain is your certificate signing for. And then below that, you have something very important, which is the X509 extension CA false. What it means is your certificate cannot be used to sign other certificates because obviously you're not a CA. So the whole goal when you create, a, when you forge a certificate is to swap those two fields. So how you do that with a collision, here's how you do it. Uh, first, you obviously rewrite uh, the cert name to say, well, I want to be able to sign for everything. So I remove the real domain name and I put a star instead. Then I put my own public key, obviously, so I can actually do the creation. And then I say, well, I'm a CA certificate, right? And then after that, you have to hide the real, private, the real public key. And you do that by hiding it into what we call the uh, Netscape comment extension. So a lot of SSL certificates have a lot of field. And one of them is the ability to jam comments in it. And you can use that as a neat trick to hide the previous public key. And you use this space to create a collision. Then you leave the signature, you copy pass it to your new, brand new uh, fake certificate, and you have a signing certificate. That's basically how you create a uh, fake uh, valid SSL certificate. 
if you think that there, that's an uh, academic attack, it's not. It turns out that uh, in 2012, um, a malware was discovered which was mainly uh, spying on an Iranian com computer. Uh, the, the malware was called Flame. I don't know if you remember it. Uh, this malware it was fairly unique in a sense that it was using a colliding certificate to push fake Windows update. What happened is someone well funded uh, decided to create a collision uh, by uh, stealing, a, by lifting the signature of a Windows terminal server, which should not have, and removing the restrictions. Those they all certificates were only used for compatibility and they had a bunch of restrictions. So what they did is they took the certificate, changed the C name, and then removed to say it's only for Windows uh, XP. They said, no, no, it's for everything. We packaged it and used it to deliver uh, malware as a form of Windows update, which was signed with a certificate to attack Iranian computer. Um, what's very interesting about this attack is uh, because it used collision, uh, we, Mark and uh, his team was able to reverse engineer how this malware works and we were able to figure out how the collision was created. And lo and behold, he didn't use any of the technique which were discussed in Academy in 2009. It was using a completely other technique which were using a four block collision. If you remember, I told you the two block collision is the way we do it because it's the most efficient. So now that the people who created the flame uh, fake certificate was not using two blocks. They were using four block, which is less efficient. You can still do it. And were using a vector, which were not the one discussed in academia. So someone in the world had enough cryptographic uh, knowledge and enough uh, resources to pull out this kind of attack, uh, which led a lot of people to uh, hypothesize it was a, a state sponsor malware. Um, and that's the explanation behind this. If you want to know more about it, there is a very, very neat paper by Mark, which is called uh, Reverse Engineering Cri of the Cryptanalytic Attack Using Flame to Super Malware, which explains all of this in detail, but that's the bottom line. So basically, you can weaponize collision to create attack, and it has been done in the past, and that's why taking collision seriously is so important. So where do we live today? Well, for the old functions, they're all dead. Uh, MD4 is dead for a very, very long time. Uh, MD5 is so dead that you can do it on your smartphone. No kidding, you can literally create a collision in your smartphone. And then SHA-1 is a new attack we created, and it took us two to the 63 computation, which is pushing the limit of what we can do. Uh, it's one of the largest uh, computation in the world, as far as we know. So how do we, did we find this collision? Well, uh, we started in 2015, and as I said, the prefix has to be fixed for SHA-1, so we had to create a clever prefix. Ange Albertini uh, was the one who uh, looked at this because he is uh, very, very well known for how to do uh, world experts into crafting interesting uh, documents. And so he came up with the idea of using PDF and JPEG so we can actually have a prefix which gives us malleability to show one image or another and make it very, very easy. I'll show you a demo in a minute. Uh, and then uh, I ran the first computation uh, between 2015 and 2016. It took me about nine months and 300,000 computer. Then uh, excitement began. Uh, we reported the result, and then uh, we had to develop the full attack, and we had quite a few uh, sweat there. I'll tell you that in a minute as well. And finally, uh, we did the second large computation early 2017, and then we uh, issue the release in the press on, in February 2017. So what Ange came up with uh, to be able to use to, the collision to its full extent was to embed a JPEG into the PD, into a PDF header, so we'll create collision which will be like valid PDF document. And the trick is uh, JPEG has something called a comment. And the idea is you will use a collision as a boundary for the length of the comment so both, both file, while having the same hash, will actually display different things because one, in one case, uh, the length will point to the first image. In the other case, uh, by rebounding on comment of comment, will rebound to another images. So while the content of the two files is the same, if someone is to open it, you will see two different images. That's the power of creating collision. And of course, you can use whichever images you would like. So now you can create any pair of Doppelganger uh, files. So try to imagine two uh, insurance contracts. One day you only have to pay $1,000, and the other one day, well, no, actually, you have to pay uh, $1 million, and those would hash the same thing. That's the kind of stuff you can do with that. So then I 
took max code and tried to scale it up to, uh, as I said, to use about 300,000 core uh, in multiple data centers around the world. And most of the complexity was to find the right balance between resilience and performances. So every time you have to dispatch a new job, we have to copy stuff in memory, move things between computer and so forth, so there is a lot of overhead. So you want to run as long as possible. At the same time, computer fail, and we have to reboot the job, or the job has been preempted and so forth. So we settled on, after a few try and out, about one hour batch, and we run, well, quite a few of those, like millions of those. Uh, and then, uh, I also refactor the code to be stateless. Uh, one of the difficult things when you do this large computation is when you have a database where you have to pull all the job. Instead of doing that, uh, we were making each job stateless so you can restart them, and then uh, we were using basically a random generator to decide which chart to do instead of having a synchronization, because otherwise you have to deal with failover and replication of the master and become a, even more, a bigger hell to, to manage. And last but not least, uh, I make a huge mistake. Um, MapReduce is a very famous computation framework, and the idea is you map your computation and you're going to reduce to all the solution. I'm like, that's perfect. That seems to be the great tool to do the job. So now it's absolutely the wrong tool for the job because the map is very, very complex. You, you explore the entire space, but reducing is the part where you aggregate all the solution is very small. <laughs> it's only a few bytes. And so we were spending a lot of time waiting for the last part of the computation to finish. I was running batches of uh, I think uh, 50,000 job at the time, so 15,000 hours by 50,000 hours. And so, we, as you can see on the graph, uh, most half of the time of the job was used for basically waiting for the last bits to finish. So for the second computation part, we actually moved away from this paradigm to uh, using a simple job system where we have a factory and a bunch of job and make them all independent, which was way more efficient. So lesson learned, don't use my produce for this job. Um, we learned that the hard way. Then becomes the part where we was the most scary. Uh, we finished the first computation uh, sometime in, I believe, January, and then uh, in the middle of the night, uh, my, my, my phone rang, and then I know I, we found the first collision, really excited. I sent an email to Mark and said, hey, we found it. Great, okay. And then he started to look at it. I'm like, can we get to it? Can we get to it? And I'm like, wait, 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 looking at it. And then it uh, turns out that at first glance, what we found was not solvable, which means that we didn't know how, we, we got an equation system to find the second block, but we couldn't figure out what was the equation system had no solution. And then we were very, very scared for many, for quite a bit of time that we couldn't do it, but then Mark and Pierre uh, figured out how to add extra condition and fix the solvability using SAT techniques to actually make it work again. <laughs> And then we were able to find more speed up to accelerate the computation, and then we were able to run the computation. And then Yarek uh, from my team actually ran the second stage of the computation uh, through GPU. So GPU is very interesting. Uh, a lot of people say GPU is great for crypto. That's true. Except the architecture is fundamentally different from uh, a CPU, so you have to rethink how you do things. In particular, uh, memory transfer is very expensive, so we couldn't do load, unload, load, unload, and those kind of stuff. You have to allocate memory, do your computation, allocate memory, and so forth. So what we started to do, and that's Pierre's idea, is to use a feed-forward, where we compute the base solution in CPU, and then we move on to the first few steps between 40 and 26, and we compute a ton of potential solution, use the GPU to compute all the next step, and until we have exostatic, do one step and move one step, move one step. When we don't have enough solution, go back and back and forth. The reason why that work is because the first few steps, you have very, very little solutions. This is a uh, graph in logarithm, uh, logarithmic uh, scale, right? So it means that the first step, you do maybe 100,000 computation. The one in the middle, you do, you have up to 100 trillions of solution. So it, it quickly ramps up. So what we do is we were, saturating the memory with as many potential next step, do all of them at once, and if we don't find a solution, backtrack, generate more solution, move back and forth and so forth. So it's a completely different way to approach cryptography. So while GPU is great for crypto, it also requires a lot of new way of uh, distributing, um, scheduling your computation because you don't have the same memory and general uh, memory manipulation as you have in CPU. All right. And then, uh, we spent 110 years uh, of uh, GPU, a far cry from the 12 million uh, we would have spent if we were using brute force, so we succeeded. That being said, before we succeeded, uh, we had a funny incident. I mean, I didn't find it funny at that time, but 
now it's okay. Uh, so Yarik finished the computation and uh, for my team and sent an email to Mark saying, hey, we found the collision and we are ready to celebrate, you know, the champagne is there for a few weeks. She would like, well, we're going to celebrate, it's going to be awesome. And Mark said, doesn't work. And you're like, what? Doesn't work. What do you mean it doesn't work? And I'm like, doesn't work. And it turns out, uh, because the way we did the computation, we had it done in big Indian instead of little Indian, and he was looking at it the other way. <laughs> yeah. So we fixed it. <laughs> it was fine. It was like a one line change, but, and then it was all fine. But I'm telling you, we were white. It's like. Anyway, so, and then we were happy. We were able to create those uh, colliding PDF. Uh, you might have uh, found them online. So basically, you have um, the same SHA, the, the same SHA one and the different SHA 256. And as you see, because we use a comment of common trick, uh, one is blue, the other one is red. Uh, that's the idea we had. Uh, and then we were like, okay, we're going to give the world 90 days before we release the, the code to create uh, two PDF, which are doppelganger. Well, trust the internet to do it in two days. Uh, so they have a better tool than ours. So uh, here the link below is as a GitHub one. So I'm using their tool. Thank you for recreating it. I, and so basically that's easy as it. So we have two PDF which have different value, a cat and a tiger. And that's what, what you do is you basically use a collider script. And the collider script will basically merge both of them into one PDF and align the comments from one point to another. And that's how fast it is. That's like literally real time. And then as you can see, boom, you have two PDFs which have the same. Thank you. Okay. And then the, uh, you have the chat 256. All right, so here is the gig version behind the scene. Uh, you have the fixed part, as I promised you, which says the PDF, uh, the PDF headers, and then below it, uh, we have the JPEG start, and you see, and then following that, we have the JPEG comment. And then at the border of the JPEG comment, we have our collision block, right? And you can see it here. Let me try to do this. Uh, you, have, you see it here, right? You have the last bit of the, of the comment, which is inside the collision block. So they would be different in both cases, right? And so, one of the comments is 173, the other one is 17F. So as a result, uh, you do create a desynchronization, and in one of the files, the image starts way lower, and it's, it's a comment in the other file. Well, so in one case, I say it's a JPEG, and then in the other case, it's a real image. And that's how it works, right? So a lot of people were confused when we showed the attack how we can do and create as many as we want. Try to explain that to the press. So like, and then that's what it is. Uh, I want to also give a big prop to Hector Martin, which is a guy who actually created the visualization. Again, I had a great one, and then he do a way better one, so I'm st stole with his permission, uh, his version, because I think that's a clearer version we have. So thank you for him to do that. Um, so post-collision world. So what happened when you create a collision? Uh, first thing, uh, and that's the thing which actually was the goal, uh, we released a collision uh, a few days, or I think even on the day of a meeting between browser, which was a, a which is a consortium to decide what is the future of a web browser, and uh, there was there was about to have discussion about uh, prolonging the lifetime of SHA-1, except it was on, so it was supposed to be sunset, but people were like, no, we might extend it because some people have complained. But in the light of the attack, uh, Firefox finally gave up and said, fine, we're going to immediately, ahead of schedule, stop it, which was exactly our intention. If we engage into doing such a long computation, it's not for the fun. Also, it was very fun. It was because we really wanted to push the world to stop using SHA-1 once and for all. And as many, many of the cryptographic loom, unless you really show the money to people and the real attacks, they tend to uh, delay it for another year, right? You know, out of the sight, out of the mind. So we decided to put it in front of you, so you have to do it. And I think for us, that was the most important thing is we deprecated SHA-1, and as a result, user we feel are safer, so that's really the goal of the entire exercise, and it was a well-worth investment. Uh, Microsoft did the same in May. 
so now all uh, I believe every browser have deprecated SHA one. So now we have we are in a better world, better place. Um, we got leaked. Someone put a bet that SHA one will be broken in 2017, literally mere hour before we were we were about to release. I have no idea who it is, but the guy made eight Bitcoin, and I want my share. <laughs> so. Uh, also, I, I, I saw Mark, so the release was about 5, uh, 5 a.m. PST because he's in Netherlands, and so I saw him a few hours before scrambling to try to get the uh, bug bounty for, the, uh, for Bitcoin. So there is these people who are giving up a little bit of Bitcoin money for the people who break Shawan to incentivize them to do, and I was seeing him rustling to get the data as the money, but he did. So he did claim the, the bounty just in time, so Mark got the bounty, that's fair. Uh, hopefully no one stole it from us. Um, and then I, I spoke about um, unforeseen, uh, unforeseen uh, situation, right? And I think the, the most impressive one, and I completely take us aback, was uh, we knew Git had problem, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute. But we didn't sort of SVN, because none of us used SVN for a very long time, so we didn't sort of it. But then, a guy from WebKit was like, WebKit, which is the uh, web wanderer for Safari, uh, one of the engineers were like, oh, we use SHA-1, uh, let me make sure we don't have vulnerable for collision, which is a great idea. And so he pushed his unit test to the SVN of WebKit, and the WebKit SVN died. It's not like you can revert, it just died. And for eight hours, you see all the WebKit engineer completely freaking out, like, did you try this command? Can we do this? And ultimately, they were able to recover it, but it literally destroys the entire SVN for WebKit for eight hours. And then Apache did, did issue an SVN uh, emergency patch to say, please do not test collision on the SVN. We know it's broken. Don't do this. So that's an unforeseen collision. Uh, that's an unforeseen situation. If we had known, we have given advance notice, but we didn't. We didn't have the test vectors. We didn't know it would break anything but we broke uh, Git, which means there are other software somewhere which are broken by, uh, by SHA-1, so you have to find a way to mitigate those, and that's going to be uh, the next part of the talk, which is, what do you do when you think there is a SHA-1 software looming into your network, right? What do you do? Well, we have a great example, Git. So, despite the early warning, and there was a long thread, and I put a link there, and they were on the slide, about people trying to warmly use Torvald to not use SHA-1. They're like, no, no, that's fine. I'm going to use SHA-1. Don't do it. No, no, that's fine. I'm going to do it. So at the end of the day, Git use SHA-1. And it's back in so many assumptions that it's really hard for them to move away from SHA-1. They, they are moving away from it, finally, but it took a long, lot of discussion, and it's not, still not there. So now we have SHA, we have a very well used software. How many of you use Git? Yeah. So all of you use something which is vulnerable to put theoretically to SHA-1 collision where we can have two blobs which have the same collision and you end up with two, uh, two different views of the world for the same uh, Git repository. Not good, right? So how do you mitigate that? Well, turns out we have a tool. And actually Mark invented this tool. Um, he, it's for, uh, he invented this tool and then applied it, as I said, to Flame. It also works for SHA-1. The idea is to use counter cryptanalysis. It's a very mouthful word, but the idea is because the way you create collision, uh, create unique property into the file, uh, most likely there are trivi trivial differences due to the way we use differential paths. You can, with a single file, detect if this file is part of a collision. It is very, very high precision. It's like um, zero, uh, the false positive are 0 0.00000, like 1701. So you can run it in a production system. It has a little bit of overhead, but it's okay. And it only, it's also to you, which is very cool to understand if you see a collision, how it has been constructed. So you know if it's ours or if it's a new one we've never seen. So that's how they did reconstruct the flame one. So counter crypt analysis, Mark improved the version he had and pushed it on GitHub. So if you have a SHA-1 software, if you're using SHA-1, please use counter crypt analysis. We do. And the, we did that. So someone from Google, Sean Pierce, um, fixed uh, Gigit to basically do counter cryptanalysis check when you submit. So Gigit will refuse any collision uh, blob. The other one who did the same thing is GitHub. GitHub in March announced in their blog, they're like, well, fine, we're going to use counter cryptanalysis. So if you use GitHub, how many of you do use GitHub? That's it? 
No, I'm kidding. There's a lot of people use it, right? Um, uh, you are protected as well because they did put in place a check when you push your, your commit to actually do this. So the way you actually deal with legacy software is by doing detection and proactive uh, mitigation. Um, and even Git got onto the counter crypt analysis bandwagon. Actually, it was uh, deployed in 2.12.2, so now we have uh, this thing. Uh, we have uh, counter crypt analysis also for every Gmail document. Uh, and every drive document who goes to our system, uh, some of our users did test on the day of the release to see if it was working as internet. It does. Uh, the reason why we do that is because we are concerned about people using old uh, client software that we don't know of. Uh, they might actually store them in backup software we don't know of. We have a lot of corporate users as well, so we don't know what their backup system are, so we basically prevent collisions that way, and you can do the same. Um, as I said, uh, we are concerned that crash legacy software, like SVN, uh, might have colliding documents with different terms like contract, lease, um, power of attorney, and so forth. And of course, black swan, which is unforeseen consequences that we don't know of, and we really don't want to know of. And uh, so how much does it cost us? About 4.5% uh, of extra computation for every email attachment that we scan that way. Uh, that's based on the 1 billion data set we tested uh, after we released it, so we believe that's a well worth investment. It's not a huge number. It's, it's significant. It's not like impossible to do. So, where does it leave us, right? Well, the future is bright. Uh, it's awesome. We have a lot of new hash function coming online. Uh, we have SHA-256 and the SHA-2 family, and we also have SHA-3 and Blake. And what's great about all of them is they are using different construction, which means that if one breaks, it's unlikely it's going to break all of them at the same time. So we have a lot of diversity to choose from. They so all have different perspectives. So we are in a very good place. So hopefully you won't have that kind of talk for the next 10 years, hopefully. Uh, yeah, yeah, so take away, SHA-1 is, SHA is finally dead. Uh, long live to SHA-256. Counter Corrupt Analysis is a really cool tool, and I, I hope I inspire you to check it out. And the future is good. So thank you very much. I'm going to take any question you would have. Uh, thank you very much.